Tom. Yeah, give him another hand. And uh, drink plenty of that water. You're not quite done, Brother Sean. And and my my well, well, you know I got a love offering in my Bible right there. And so uh, all right, <laughs> and uh, grab my Bible, Mike. Don't let him get that real quick. Um, I want to hear one more before when he's finished. I bowed on my knees and cried holy. That's easy to sing. That's easy to sing. you got three hours to Alexandria when you leave to rest your throat. You'll be fine. And uh, we'll close out with that one if that's all right. Okay, all right. All right, well, we're glad to have Brother Mike Fiedler here tonight as well. And uh, that's his name, Mike Fiedler. And uh, glad to have him. When I was with Brother Ken in June uh, for their 12th anniversary, we were eating supper uh, that Saturday night, and he said, um, he said, listen, let me share with you some things about uh, what the Lord's doing here in our life, and of course, he shared some things himself from our pulpit during our mission conference about his, uh, his health, Miss Sherry's health, some things there, mentioned some prayer requests, and, and uh, he said, then, he said, you pray for us, he said, we really need uh, some help on the, on the reservation, and uh, of course, many of you have been there. You see how hard they work, what the Lord has done there through Brother Ken and Miss Sherry. And so when I was there in June, he said, uh, he said I think God has uh, provided us a man to help us. And he said his name is Michael Fiedler. And he spoke extremely highly of you, Brother Michael. And I told him then, Brother Ken, I said, well, give him my number. We want to we wanna have him at Parkwood and uh, get to know him and allow him to introduce himself to, uh, to our people. Um, because when the day that Brother Ken and Miss Sherry are no longer able to work on Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, we still want representation there. We've got too much invested there, and, um, and we still want a relationship with, with them. And, and so we're thrilled to have Brother Fiedler here tonight. And uh, so I asked him to come and to bring, uh, bring our, our message this evening. And so, Brother, you come and share what the Lord's put on your heart. We're thrilled to have you here at Parkwood Baptist Church. And uh, make him feel welcome. It's an honor to be here. There's, uh, I appreciate the spirit. There's, ladies, that was a blessing. Brother, it was a blessing. There's, uh, if you want to come out west sometime, you just holler at me. There's, uh, there's, well, I'm a country boy from northwest Ohio. So there's, uh, I grew up on a farm up there and, like your pastor used to tell me last night how he grew up on a farm and God put him in the middle of the city. Well, God's called me to go to the poorest town or poorest county in the United States. But uh, I'll give you a little bit of uh, background just briefly. We, uh, I grew up on a farm and it was always my dream to farm. I, uh, we just did some hay and some cattle and and horses and things and we, uh, but God led me to join the Army. I was an infantry soldier in the Army for uh, nine years total between active and reserves. Didn't plan on that many years, but I was supposed to get out right after September 11th happened. So, um, you know, that didn't really work out so well. So, uh, but praise the Lord, God taught me a lot through that and matured me and, and different things. And um, I grew up Catholic. There's, uh, I grew up in a town. I know this is hard to believe down here. But there was one church. It was a Catholic church. There's not a Baptist church in that entire county in Ohio, believe it or not. But my mom's side of the family was Christian from uh, southern Ohio. And I used to go to church with my grandmother. And I used to spend time on their farm down there and things. And uh, my great-grandmother got saved in the Billy Sunday Crusade. I have the decision slip. That's a blessing. But... uh, Anyway, I just prayed for the truth because that made me confused. I got saved when I was 12, but then I was an altar boy There's uh, in the Catholic Church. I went to Christian school for three years. And, but God knew. I don't know if you know much about the way when they did the things with the Indians on the reservations. A lot of the way they were trying to get them to assimilate is through the Catholic Church is one of the ways. And so there's, I had a man out there two weeks or two, about two months ago, actually, maybe six weeks ago, I lose track of time, but they, he asked me, he says, why does the Pope 
not visit us here. This is a man that comes to church all the time that's saved and all that, but he was just confused. You know, there's like, does he not like us? And so I got to share that with him and different things and why we don't need to worry about that and we don't need to put, put somebody up to that level and different things. But anyway, so fast forward, there's, uh, I uh, farmed, I was an infantry soldier. I went to school after I got out of the army for electrical engineering because that's what I started when I went to vocational school. So I have a degree in electrical engineering. I started my own business done automation and robotic systems for uh, 20 years. Uh, just to make the story short, then in 2009, I got, God led me to an independent Baptist church. I'm married. My wife's name is Katie. I uh, have a 19, almost 19-year-old 19 son, Mason, David, 15, uh, Josiah is 12, and my baby girl that's not so much a baby anymore is 10. So there's, uh, but led us to that church, and I was a businessman, and I uh, had my own business traveling all over North America, and there's employees, well, nobody would take the kids to camp. Nope, and nobody had time. I'm like, what? These kids need to go to camp. So I took the kids to camp. The young kids, then like two weeks later, I took the teenagers to camp. I think God worked in my heart more than he, he did on theirs. But the pastor asked me when I got back a couple weeks later, he said, would you pray about being the youth director in the church? I was already a deacon in the church. And I said these exact words. You want me to do what, when, and how? That's exactly what I told him. <laughs> there, there's... Uh, but I had enough reverence for, for the man of God. I said, yes, I'll pray about it. And so I was youth director for six and a half years. And then we did a back to school revival, me and two other youth pastors in 2015. And God called me to sell my family farm, to quit my job. I had sold the one business by that time and had a couple other smaller ones. And left that business, sold there, I had bought the home place off my parents. I literally even told my wife we, when we got married, we'll never move. Don't ever say never to God if you're surrendered to him. But I want to read you a couple of verses here. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, in verse 1, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us, as they were singing about. In the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for the, he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Verse 2, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. God changed my life verse that day to that verse. It's no longer about me and about what I want. It's about what he wants. Amen. Then I lived on the road for nine years uh, as an evangelist, missionary evangelist, uh, church planner, worked on reservations, worked in boys and troubled boys and girls' homes, uh, helped to start churches, help pastors, help train young preachers. Then, last summer, or a year ago, this past summer, I was at a church plant in central South Dakota, and I was supposed to be going to Gillette, Wyoming, and my daughter got sick. My baby Joy got sick, and we couldn't go. So we had to stay there for Wednesday night. And Ken and Sherry Trivet had the choir there that Wednesday. And I watched 15 or 18 Oglala Lakota Sioux sing their heart out to the Lord like I've never seen a choir sing before, some of them weeping. I sat there and wept. We talked to Miss Ken or Miss Sherry and Brother Ken, and, and we had a blessed time, and I shared with them what we'd been doing. And, we had been working on starting a church on the Omaha Reservation with a couple churches there 
in the summers that have no church of any kind. And so I had no idea that he was struggling with his health or he'd been praying for somebody to come and different things. Well, I seen him in North Carolina this, this spring, and he asked me to pray about coming, and I told him no, like I do everybody else that asked me to come pastor or do anything like that. And, there's, and then the Lord smote my heart, and I said, yes, I'll pray about coming. Then I told my wife, I said, I had the weirdest thing happen. And I told her about it, and she goes, well, maybe you need to pray about it. We've been saying God it seemed like God was maybe shaking some things up a little bit. And I'm like, I didn't want to hear that. <laughs> then I counseled with a couple men of God, a friend of mine, and different things, and then they said stuff that they were led by the Spirit, and I appreciate men that are led by the Spirit, and it just, God kept working on me. I went out in April, and God just broke my heart. And, but I asked God, I said, God, a burden's not a call. You know I've had times that it was only that I knew I was called to do what I was doing that kept me going and that I kept my eyes on you. And he, I wrestled with him that night because I was comfortable. And you know what? You say, how can you be comfortable living in a fifth wheel with four kids and a wife traveling the country? Well, God's grace is all I can say. God's grace. So I just surrender. I said, Lord, you know that I'll do whatever you want me to do. And then I've spent the last how many months trying to fulfill my schedule and transition at the same time. And God's just grown me through that and trying to keep my focus on what I was doing and where my feet was at while my heart was out there. And it's hard to explain those things unless you've been through it. But... You know, you say, and I don't know, you know, some of you have been there. I've worked with a lot of broken people, troubled boys, troubled girls, and we're all broken in our own way, if we'll be honest. You know, we all have things in our life that, we, you know, that, we've, that have happened. We've all been hurt. We have all have struggles and different things. So in, in the way we deal with that or don't deal with it, that, that creates brokenness, you know, in, in our hearts and in things and hardness in our hearts. But you see, neither one of my parents ever met their real father. And my only grandpa that I knew that was a grandpa in my life that adopted my mama, he was an Indian. And he was saved. He's in heaven now. It was when he died is when I got into church. But I just shared that just so you could understand a little bit about who I am. And uh, I've seen the Lord do a lot of things. And we've watched God do some amazing things. And we're excited about what God's doing. The 12th of November, we're rolling west and not going to look back. So I had an old preacher one time tell me, whatever you do, do it with all your heart and act like you're going to be there forever. Because I, I talked to these preachers and stuff. They're like, well, this is a stepping stone and all that. And let me tell you, I've been traveling across the United States trying to tell people, you know what? The best thing that we can do is be content where we're at and stop trying to be somebody we're not. Because, you know what, There's, we all think we need to be somebody. Well, we need, to be, we need to be what the somebody made us to be. I'm just a bald, uh, bearded preacher, and you know what, I'm okay that I don't have hair. I tell teenagers all the time, you know what, I'm okay that I don't have any hair because that's the way God made me. You know what? We need to be okay with the way we are. We really do. Because, you know, deep down, we all, to a certain extent, struggle with that from time to time. Otherwise, we wouldn't be ashamed of Jesus. Think about that for a minute. But I'd like to preach a message to you this evening. There's, on the love of God, I was praying about several different messages, but uh, they were singing about that there's several years ago I started praying and asking the Lord well I guess I started first of asking God to give me a burden give me tears for lost souls other than my father and other than my family members because I have a lot of family members that are lost but you know I ask him God give me tears and you know, 
Then he laid on my heart a while later, the Holy Spirit, to where to understand. I've been praying for several years for, for God to help me to understand his love so that I could love others the way he loves me. You think about that for a minute. They sang about that. That was tremendous. Young lady, you keep your eyes on Jesus. But we need to understand. We'll never completely understand the love of God till we look upon his face someday. I can't wait for that day to look upon his face. But then I get rid of the stinking flesh too. So it'll be a real good day. But if you would, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 35. There's, might have good enough lighting here. to. I'm, I'm just at the place where I need reading glasses sometime, but I think we're good here. So Romans chapter 8 and verse 35. The Bible says, this is Paul speaking, Who shall separate us? From the love of Christ, Paul asked. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as the sheep as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, Paul said, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Just stay with me now. Don't turn me off. I mean, we think we know a whole lot more about the Bible. We think we know a whole lot more about the love of God. We think we know a whole, that we're a whole lot closer to God than what we are. But can I say something the Lord showed me a few years ago? We don't even know what we don't know. Would you agree? We don't even know what we don't know. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Hold your, hold your finger here in Romans 8. We'll be back in just a second. But the love of God. What is love? We live in a world that throws the word love around very loosely from a young age. What is love? True love, charity, it's not about us. True love, the love of God, is not about us. Look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. This is Paul speaking again. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels... And have not charity or true love, I am become as sounding brass or tinkling cymbals. He's saying, I can, I can have, I can speak with the tongues of men and of angels. I can have all these things that God's given me and have not charity. And I become as sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. Can I say, I believe that's kind of where the church has become. Is we're just like, we're doing all these things, but because we don't have, we don't have the love of God and we don't have the love of God that's shown out of us and through us, what we say is like, wah, 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 wah. People don't care what we have to say. You've heard the, maybe the, the, um, the saying, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. You know, I've worked with many people broken. You know, I think about the Oglala Lakota Sioux. I think about the times I've been there every month since the beginning of May. Just trying to build relationships and, and you know, transitioning, trying to help uh, Brother Ken and Miss Sherry. 
And you know why God's done such a great work there? It's because Brother Ken and Miss Sherry has just loved them. And loved them in a way that is not a fleshly love. Because they've loved them regardless of what they've done or not done. Because, see, that's true love. It's unconditional. Agape love, as, as, as the Bible there, there's, uh, calls it. But you see, the only thing that's going to reach those, as well as many here in this area, is the true love of God. And it's the true love of God shining through us. In us loving people because Jesus loves them and because Jesus loves us. But see, we can't love others. We can't love others if we don't know. How can you do something you don't even know what it is? So if we don't understand the love of God, how can we love like God? How can we love the way he loves us unconditionally? Think about that. And he says in verse 2, 1 Corinthians 13, 2, and though, this is Paul speaking, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, very wise man, and though I have all faith, that's a pretty big deal, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity. What does it say? I am nothing. Without true love, without them seeing the love of God through us, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, it says in verse 3, and though I give my body to be burned, that's a pretty big deal. That good to feed the poor, it's a great thing. But though I give my body to be burned, that's a very serious thing. And have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Not a little bit, nothing. He's serious about this. Charity, look at that in verse 4. True, unconditional love suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth, or flaunt, or boast not itself. It's not, is not puffed up. In verse 5, doth not behave. Charity doth not behave itself unseemly. Or it does not seeketh not her own. It's not about him. You know what? I preached in a, a, uh, in, a, in a church planners conference in February on the need in America to, I don't know, like 70 preachers in the South. On the need in America. So I showed them all what they were expecting and different things. I showed them all of this, like that. there's only uh, 27 towns in the state of Nebraska that have Baptist churches of any kind in them and then South Dakota, and just all these different other places, and all that. I put a lot of work into all that. But you know what God showed me? You know what the true need in America is? Is that we produce fruit. That the churches and the Christians produce fruit, because we wouldn't have any problem reaching the world if our churches and our Christians would produce fruit. And you know what it takes, the Bible says, to produce fruit? Dying to ourselves. It's not about us. It's not about me. It's not about me. When, when the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord of our life, we get a hold of his love. There's nothing you won't do for him. There's nothing he asks of you that you won't do. Because it's true love. You don't envy. It's not about you anymore. You know what? This was so much easier than the last time when he changed. He's just changing my direction a little bit. And he was using the other to prepare me for this. But you know, it's that love. You know why there's so many ministries that don't really, and there's so many broken people that literally, there's, it's because they don't understand that God loves them. The Ogallala Lakota Sioux, need to understand, just like we all do, that God loves them unconditionally. And that the only way they're going to truly see that is if they see it in me or through me 
or my wife or my children first. Just like the only way the people around here are going to see the true love of God is through you. And when people start to really get a hold of that, this place won't hold them all, honestly. Because it seeketh not her own. It's not about you. Charity is not easily provoked, it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Charity thinketh no evil. True love thinketh no evil. Look, I don't have this down pat, but that's why I ask God on a daily basis, God, help me to understand your love so that I can love others in that way. You know what? It doesn't matter there's, that I'm going to the poorest place or the poorest county in the United States because they, everybody needs Jesus. You know, we need, there, there's, we need people all over. There there's needs to be many more people proclaiming the gospel through our actions and our words, even in this area. 1 Corinthians 13, 6 says, Rejoiceth, charity rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Charity beareth all things, and believeth all things, and hopeth all things, and endureth all things. So beareth and endureth, they're similar. Because you know what? We're going to have to bear some things. We're going to have to endure some things. You know what? There's some people in this world. You know what? There's some people in this very room that some of you have to, that you have to bear or endure. You know what? We're all different. We have different personalities. We different things, but you know what? We're made different. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's real easy to get along with certain people. Other people, it's not as easy. But if we love like Jesus, I'm thankful that he wants to talk to me a whole lot more than I want to talk to him. Aren't you? Isn't that the truth? Do we want to talk to Jesus as much as he wants to talk to us? Unfortunately not. That's the truth. Let's be honest. I hope there's one thing that you can put with my name, and that's that Brother Mike Fiedler wants to be real. You know what? I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You know what? I've found God's shown me what it is to be somebody and to have a little bit of money, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at the end of the day. It's all his anyway. He's the only one that's somebody. But you see... Watch this. Verse 8. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So at the end of the day, all that matters is true, unconditional love. Of God and the rest will take care of itself I've watched person after person after person after person that if you just love them to Jesus just love them even when they don't want to be loved even when they do things wrong to you I could give you so many illustrations of how people's hurt me or my family or different things like that but you know what like I told your pastor Today at lunch, there ain't, there's no one that's hurt me the way they hurt Jesus. I haven't had to go through what Jesus went through. I haven't had to go through what Paul went through. But you know what? If that's the Lord's will, then so be it. We don't know what's coming in this country. We're spoiled Americans. We really are at the end of the day, if we're honest. The best way to show true love is love people when they're not easy to love. Can I tell you, God's even helped me with this, even in my own marriage. If I can love like Jesus loves, if I can understand his love, the love of God, then I'm going to love my wife for who she is, not what she does or does not do, not the mood that she's in or you know, if she's happy and joyful, you know, any of that kind of stuff. And she's going to do the same. To me and all of us. Do you see how that works? How can, how can we be like that? 
to show true love, to love people when they're not easy to love. Turn with me back over to Romans chapter 8. How can we be like that? We truly understand the love of Christ in our heart. Truly understand. Romans 8 in verse 35, there, there's that we read, who, Paul said, shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? You know, we got a lot of things going on in this country right now. But you know, what are they going to do? I remember, I think I, I thought about, I just came from a church up in Michigan a few weeks ago. I finished my last revival up there, and, and uh, it was a church that I went to in June of 2020. COVID was in full swing. Michigan was closed, and we were doing a tent revival in Michigan. I was off the road for three weeks out of all of COVID. My God is amazing. He never ceases to amaze me. You know what? Our problem is, is we just don't believe him. We just don't trust him. You know, people make a big deal out of my testimony and what I walked away from and all that kind of stuff, but I don't walk away from anything. I trusted God, and I obeyed him. It's that simple. It's really that simple. Trust and obey. There is no other way. But you see, what are they going to do? Are they going to take away my birthday? Are they going to put me in jail? Are they going to send me to heaven? Maybe this is the infantry soldier coming out in me a little bit. And, you know, there's, but what are they going to do? I have a God in heaven that loves me more than I can comprehend. And I, my, this land is not my home. I'm just passing through. Think about it. What are they going to do? Besides those, nothing. What can separate you? That's what Paul's saying. We need to get a hold of some of them. You know what God showed me? Why did Paul talk and do, how did God use Paul the way he did? Because he got a hold of some things. He got a hold of some things of dying to himself. You think about that. If I put, and I'm going to, you put a seed in the ground. What does that seed have to do to produce fruit? The Bible uses this as an illustration. It has to die, and it will produce fruit 10, 100 fold of what it is. Our problem is, is we don't die to ourselves because we don't understand the love of God. Because it's about us instead of about him. And if it's about him, then it's about others. And then people, we can't hide that. We think that we're hiding what's in our heart, but God knows. The Bible says, who knoweth the heart of man but God? But you see, look at this. Paul says in verse 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Look, those people out there, that's, that's what they think. They think us Christians are crazy. Can I tell you, Northwest Ohio, I was telling your pastor this, there was people there that would not even tell what I was doing because they just said, well, he moved away. They thought I was crazy. But you know what? Nay, he says in verse 37, in all these things, we're more than conquerors. How? Not in us, but through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, Paul said, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, you know, none of the things in this life, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Do you believe that? Which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What love, as they sang about, most of the songs they sang was about what Jesus did for us. It'd do us some good to be still and know that he's God and meditate on his word and what he did for us. You know what? Our love is conditional. God's love is unconditional. Turn with me to John chapter 15. And we'll, this is the last place we'll be. Well, we'll go to 1 John just briefly, but our love is conditional. God's love is unconditional. There is no 
John 15 and verse 9. Our love is conditional. God's love is unconditional. John 15 and verse 9, this is Jesus speaking, says, As the Father hath loved me. I want you to, I want you to stay with me for a second and, and, and you know, get rid of the distractions and just, just think about this. Think about Jesus saying this for a second. As the Father, as God the Father, the Creator the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one that spoke this world into existence, the one that we don't know as well as we think we do. He says, Jesus says, As the Father, God the Father hath loved me. Look at that, what it says. I want everybody to look at it, John 15, verse 9. As the Father, as God the Father had loved me, so have I loved you. Jesus says, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. I want you to think about that for a second. No matter how young or how old, I want you to think about that God the Father loved His only begotten Son. He loved Jesus. We can't really comprehend that. But He says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Can I say if that, can't, if that won't, if you don't let that help you with your struggles in your life, nothing can I've worked with so many broken people. I've counseled so many people, different things. And you know what? It always happens. I'll counsel them, and they'll start coming to me, and they'll start looking to me instead of looking to God. I have to cut them off. I have a young man right now that I won't take his phone calls. You say, that's harsh. But you know what? It's because he, he has to go to the Lord. He's relying too much on me. Say, how do you know that? God, I ask the Lord and the Holy Spirit will lead you. You know what? When he comes to himself, when he realizes some of that. I've, I've done it multiple times. I've seen it work. But you know, we've got to. What you struggling with tonight? What's that brokenness in your heart? What's the things that have happened to you in your life in that people hurt you in, in things, whether maybe when you were a child or, or older or as, as you've grown and, and just, the, just the weight that you bear in this life of the world that we go around in our jobs and our everyday lives. As the Father hath loved me, Jesus said, so have I loved you. If you can get a hold of the fact that Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you just as much as he loves me. He loves you just as much as he loves Pastor Wesley. He loves you just as much as he loves anybody else. And you know what? He's not far from you. And he wants to hear from you. And his thoughts are more than the sand. Where yet tonight? Well, I'm big and I'm tough and I, I can take care of it myself. Well, you know what we used to say as, a, as, a, as an infantry soldier? We used to say we're hard as woodpecker lips. Think about it. That's pretty hard, isn't it? Can you peck on wood? We're hard as woodpecker lips. That's what we, that's what we said. I was prideful as prideful could come. I'm telling you. There's, but... That's what we are so many times. We don't let God. God's up there. I want to help you. I'm not, he's not far from you. I want you to understand how much I love you. I sent my only begotten son to die for you. I sent him to earth to pay your sin debt. 
for you because I loved you. You don't deserve it, but I love you so much because it's unconditional love. It's the love of God. But I want you to think about that. My prayer is tonight that this will sear this into your mind. And God will use this the rest of your life. And he'll bring it back to your mind and back to your mind. And you'll let him work in your heart through this. As the Father, as God the Father hath loved me, Jesus, so have I loved you, Jesus said. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you in a way that you can't understand. But if you want to understand, he'll help you. It'll help your heart in ways that you can't imagine. Remember, you don't know what you don't know. Look at the end of that verse with me. John 15, verse 9. So as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. And there's a colon there, right? I'm good at math, not English so much. Enough to get by. But it says, continue ye in my love, Jesus said. How can you continue in something that you don't even know what it is? I feel like that's where the church is today. That's where most Christians are today. We don't understand the love of God. We understand the love of man, the conditional love. But he said, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. And what's it say there in verse 10? If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide or be, you shall stay in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. But watch this now in verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy, Jesus' joy, might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Why do we struggle so much to have joy? Because we're trying to do it. And we can't. That tells us we can't. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy, Jesus' joy, might remain in you and that your joy might be full only if you understand his love. Only if you love others the way he does. There's a thing, look, I have done so many things in my life that God's allowed me to do, and I wouldn't change the last nine years. I had less money, I had less, nobody knew me, no nothing, and I would take the last nine years of, of, of my life over the first 39 years of my life. And people used to think I was somebody. I was on boards of colleges and different things and all that kind of stuff. I was respected in my field. I still have headhunters that call me. I only tell you that not so you think I'm somebody, but because, you know, I understand. But you know what? The true joy only comes from Jesus. True joy only comes from Jesus, and it comes from watching God. I would not trade a million dollars to watch God work in one person's heart and change their life and me have anything to do with it at all. One person, a million dollars, because true joy only comes from Jesus. It only, that's how your joy is going to be full. You search all over, you're worried about who's your friend and who's not your friend and who likes you and all these different things. And about all what you have and all these things and you're just chasing after things that bring emptiness. It's the love of God that bring joy. And it's only if you understand that. And he wants you. He wants you to. He wants you to understand it and live it and, and your joy to be so full that it just spills out to everyone around you. That's the outcome, is your joy is full. He says in verse 12 there, this is my commandment. What are the two cream? That ye love one another as I have loved you. How can you love one another in the way he loved us if we don't understand his love? Truly in our hearts. 
That's why, that's why we're a mess. Look, I say we because, look, I don't have this down pat. But boy, the more God shows me, the more long-suffering I am. The more God shows me, the more it doesn't matter. Look, he was preparing me. You know what? I'm going to get hurt over and over and over and taken advantage of. But you know what? Nothing like Jesus was. And I already have. I love this verse because I was a soldier, but first and foremost, because of Jesus in verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. I'm glad that I have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother in Jesus. But you know what? Even though we have that, we need to understand that love more. He needs to grow us. You know what? We're only as close to God as we want to be. He's there. He's waiting. He wants us. He wants us to, to understand his love. He wants to use us. He wants to bring honor and glory to himself through us. When you start to truly understand God's love, you love God for who he is, not what he does. It's unconditional. I close with this. Turn to 1 John chapter 4. I'm just about done. I want to show you something that will help you here in these couple verses. Look in verse 16. Lastly, as we close. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. 1 John 4, 16. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Now these love, if you study that, that's, and you look at the Greek, that's, that's agape love. That's unconditional love. Verse 17, herein is our love made perfect. This is how our love is made perfect. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. That we can stand before God and that he can tell us, well done. Because as he is, so are we in this world. He understands. Jesus walked in the flesh, in this world. there. Watch this in verse 18. There is no fear in love. What rules us in this life? Fear. What does the world try to use to control us? Fear. But watch this. There is no, in verse 18, there is no fear in love, but but perfect love, agape love, what's it say? Casteth, gets rid of, casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment. We all know that. He that feareth is not made perfect in what? In love. Isn't that amazing? not made perfect in his love we have to understand i found in my life that if i want it i truly want it and i want it for the right reasons god will give it to me maybe not in the timing that i want i'm impatient but god continues to teach me patience we love him because he first loved us how about you tonight You want to understand God's love? You want to humble yourself to admit that you really don't understand God's love? We're not going to reach this world for Christ as he commanded. We're not going to have a heart for souls if we don't understand his love. In love like Jesus loved. He can help you no matter what's going on in your life if you let him. If you have a desire to understand his love. Let's stand. Heads bowed and eyes closed.
maybe someone's here that's lost tonight before I turn it over to Pastor Wesley, that you've never truly accepted Christ as your Savior. You've never really understood how someone loved you so much, that could love you so much, that they would send their only begotten son to this earth to die for you. For your sin, for your wrong. And they did nothing wrong. But that God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for you for the payment of your sin. And you've never truly put the, your trust and faith in him in doing that. You haven't. I ask that you would open your heart tonight to put your trust and faith in him. Let's pray, and I'm going to turn it over to Brother Wesley. Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for who you are, how amazing you are, and I thank you that you want to hear from us and that we can come to you. You tell us you to cast our cares upon you. Father, I just thank you for your presence, and I just ask that you would just do what only you can do. Father, work in hearts in the way each person has need. Draw people to yourself. Father, in only the way you can. We love you. Help us to understand your love in a greater way. We ask all this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. The altar's open.